Okay, I think I'm going to make a start because it's ten past the hour. Hi, I'm Claire Trowell. I'm the Marshall Librarian, so you probably remember me from induction, if you haven't seen me since. Um, I've been asked to come and talk to you about how to find literature for your essay, so part one, paper five. I hope this will be useful. I dare say some of you will know some of this stuff already, but I'm sure there will be people who don't know everything. So I'm hoping that even if you know a lot of this, and I hope you do, that there are some useful tips this afternoon. So um, some of you may have already done this, but if you picked up the minute paper and you haven't yet answered question one, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to just write down what you're hoping to get out of this afternoon for your essay. Right, okay. So this is what I'm actually going to talk to you about. So if you've written down something else, it's not the end of the world. You can come and talk to me any time about it separately. Um, or maybe I'm not the appropriate person to talk to it about, so maybe it's your supervisor. But what we're actually going to look at is how to plan a literature search using keywords, understand how to read and make notes effectively. I hope you've probably got the hang of this already, but I've just got one or two tips that you might find useful. Understand plagiarism and how to avoid it. I know you've all been told about plagiarism. I'm sure you feel reasonably confident about what it is, but again, I think you might find a few tips on how to avoid doing it useful. And finally, you will know how to reference correctly in economics. So, here's a question for you. Why do you need to search databases? Perhaps you'd like to spend a little time talking to the person next to you. about what you think a database is and why you might need to search it. If you're not sat next to somebody, then perhaps turn around and talk to the people behind you. Okay, so. There's a few more questions. So what's a journal? I hope that because you've nearly come through your first year, you all know what a journal is. Is there anybody who wants to admit to being confused about that? No, that's good. Okay. Um, why can't I just use books? I'm sure you don't just use books. I'm sure you wouldn't, but it's a question I've been asked before. And why can't I just use Google? So there are lots of reasons why we would use Google, and that's perfectly fine. But for doing an essay, it's not enough. So a journal is the main method for reporting academic work. It's where you're going to find the most up-to-date scholarship, usually, although in economics there's somewhere else to go for even more up-to-date scholarship. It's based on evidence and research. It's peer-reviewed. Do you all know what peer-reviewed means? Can you stick your hand... I'm sorry about this. I know it's really annoying, but if, could you stick your hand up just to let me know so that I'm not boring people? Do you all know what peer-reviewed is? Do you want to stick your hand up if you do? Okay. So that's most of you, so I won't go on about that. Are you aware that you cannot find most peer-reviewed journals via a search engine, just a general search engine like Google, and why that is? It's because they're indexed by databases, so the question at the beginning was why, what is a database and why do you need to search it? And one of the reasons is that this is where you're going to find most of the scholarly work you need to look for. <coughs> So could I have a show of hands to see how many of you are currently using databases to find that information? None, nobody at all. What about iDiscover? Have you used iDiscover to find journal articles? Yeah. Okay. Well, iDiscover is great, and it does index all those journal articles. Hands up if you're frustrated with iDiscover at any time. Because it doesn't always behave itself. I don't know if you've had the experience, which we get quite often, 
um, in the library where you put certain keywords in and you get a certain set of results and then you try later and you get a different set of results. It's something we've complained about. We don't exactly know what iDiscover's doing. So it doesn't always behave in the way it should. The other problem with iDiscover is that you get what I would call a lot of noise. So if you put keywords into iDiscover, you will get a hell of a lot of hits because it's searching so much stuff. Now, if you use a database, particularly Econlit would be the one I'd recommend for economics, a database that's focused in your area or on what you want to search in, you're not going to get so overwhelmed. And it will index that peer-reviewed material and you should be able to get through directly to the full text certainly when you're on campus if you use databases so what is a database then did did any of you just think databases meant databases of data as a you know data sets as opposed to text and literature because I know that's a confusion, and obviously you do have databases of data, and in a sense, text is data. But I'm talking about bibliographic databases in this instance, so databases that are indexing the peer-reviewed literature that you need. So in a database of this type, you will find journal articles, conference papers, and other academic documents. And it will only search the quality material, the academic material, and the content that is paid for. So I am paying quite a lot for you to have access. Even if you get to it via Google, which if you do Googling on campus, you will quite often get straight through to the full text. I guess you're all about to go somewhere else for the vacation. Is that right? And when you're off campus, you will need to ensure that you're logged into Raven if you want to have that experience, because it won't know you're in Cambridge or anything to do with Cambridge. The other thing that a database has is advanced functionality. So if you're really trying to do a really complex search, it's got the ability to drill down and get rid of all the chaff, which is what you get with iDiscover. Okay, my other question, why can't I use books? I'm guessing that as your economists, you perhaps only use textbooks as opposed to using books for essays. Is there anybody who's yet written an essay only using books? I bet there isn't. No. Okay. So what's the problem with books? If it's a key book, like the key textbook on a particular thing, it might be really important to use that book. It's an overview. Um, it can introduce ideas and authors to follow up. If it's your key textbook, it's clearly going to be helping you with your course, and it is going to be worth using that book. It might suggest further reading if you're looking at an essay topic, but one of the problems with books is that they take a while to publish. So obviously, by the time it's published, even if it's just out, there's probably been a lot of journal articles and in economics working papers before you ever get to that book. So it's not going to be the most cutting-edge thing, usually. It doesn't mean to say that I am saying don't ever read a book. A research monograph um, can be very important in humanities and social sciences, but you would also need to check journals. And certainly when you're doing this first-year essay, I think using journals is a really sensible way to go because it's how you get to a summarised version of the research quickly and it will be up to date. So if you're already feeling happy finding journals, using iDiscover, you're, you're doing very well and you're not doing anything wrong. That's great. So why can't we just use Google? Because Google indexes everything. If you just go to straightforward Google, the first hit you normally get on any subject is Wikipedia. Now, if you know nothing at all about a subject, so... That might be me, um, knowing nothing whatsoever about econometrics. I might very well go to Wikipedia to read about econometrics because I'm not an economist, and I'm sure it would give me a reasonably good overview. Um, nowadays, most Wikipedia articles are well-researched. They're Wikipedia editors. I've had a go at doing it myself, and I haven't got on with it very well. Has anybody here done any Wikipedia editing? 
No, no Wikipedia editors. Quite often, because there's a lot of peer review in that process, Wikipedia articles can be surprisingly good. Um, but it's not acceptable to ever reference a Wikipedia article for an essay. I'm sure you know that. I'm sure you've been told that before. So you can use it as a starting point. You can use it to look for references. But don't ever just rely on what's in that general Wikipedia article. Do remember, if you go to Google and you put keywords in, you may not have seen everything that's available. You will see things that are free. And things that are free are problematic. They may not be the best um, information available. They might even be Donald Trump-style fake news. So you need to search in various places to get a good impression of work already done on your topic. So it w when would it be perfectly acceptable to use Google? Well, if you're looking for, um, I want to look at everything OECD is publishing, a non-governmental organisation, or I want to go to the government website to see what they're saying about this particular issue. And again, in economics, that might be something you do need to do for your essay to see what the latest strategy, policy, and planned laws might be. So yes, of course you'd go to Google to do that. But all I'm saying is it's not the only way. If you are going to use Google, I would encourage you to use Google Scholar. So could you just humour me again and stick your hand up if you regularly use Google Scholar? A few of you. Have you set your preferences? So the way to use Google Scholar smartly is to set your preferences. It's a really good thing to go there and compare what you found on iDiscover with Google Scholar. And it pains me to say this as the librarian, but actually if you're looking for keyword searches, it might actually be faster. So when you're doing an essay and you need good information quickly, as long as you go to Google Scholar and you set your preferences, you won't see everything, but you might find some really good stuff. So I'm not saying don't do that. What I am do saying is go and set those preferences. So you go to Google Scholar, and there's the triple line menu here. So you click that and you get this menu. And right at the bottom, you've got this settings. So if you go to settings, you can do this on your laptops. And then from settings, there's a further menu. And what you need is library links, which is this one in the middle. And when you get there, you'll have a big search box. So you just type University of Cambridge in, because that's your university, and click the little spy search button and you'll get two options come up open world cat which will search all the libraries in the entire world so if you were looking for a book it would tell you which libraries it was at might not be that helpful if it's the university of michigan that has the book but you know you will be able to if it's a rare book or an old book you would be able to locate it somewhere and of course the university of cambridge e-journals at cambridge so you just tick both those boxes you click this save button, but it's really important that to retain those settings, you turn your cookies on. And when you've done that, each time you search in Google Scholar after that, you won't just get a list of references, but you'll get that PDF link, and you will be able to click through, even if you're away from Cambridge, <coughs> and get into the actual full text that we've paid for. It's always a good idea to make sure you're logged into Raven when you're off campus, though. So make sure, if you're going home for Easter, remember to log into Raven if you're trying to access our online subscriptions. Right. So I've also given you a piece of paper. Um, this is not necessarily for you to fill in. It's just to give you an idea of what to think about. Some people like to um, list their keywords in a very... This is what I would do. I'm somebody who likes lists, so I'd put my keywords in sets of words that match. You might be a mind map person. So if you're one of those people who thinks in that way, you could do that on the back of the sheet of paper. I don't mind how you do it. But you need to think about those keywords. When you're searching for literature to write your essay, then you're obviously going to search, use the keywords in the essay title, which I know you all know. You've all written lots of essays before. But it's a good idea to make sure, particularly with more obscure topics, that you've thought of alternative keywords. 
Because if you've used the most obvious word, um, a word like social, for example, you're going to get so many hits wherever you put that in. You're going to need to add it to another concept or you're going to need to think of another word that explains that to make sure you've covered all the bases. And then I just thought I'd give you these few little tips which I've always found useful. So if you use an asterisk, and this will work with Google and it will work with most bibliographic databases, if you stick that asterisk after a word like urban, like the stem of a word, it won't just bring back every instance of the word urban, but you'll get urbanism, urbanised, urbanisation, with both the S's and the Z's, so it takes care of that American-British spelling issue. So if it's not specifically urban you want, but any words with that stem, you can use the asterisk. I've already mentioned the word social, so I think social class is a good example just because the word social, particularly in social sciences, appears in so many contexts. And equally, the word class could appear in so many contexts. If you're actually looking for social class, the best thing is to put it in those speech marks because not only will that bring back everything with both those words in together, it will bring them back in that order which for social class might seem very obvious, but for another set of words might not work so well if you haven't used the speech marks. <coughs> when you use advanced search in databases, you can um, restrict by field, so author, title, keyword. You might be able to search in keyword title and abstract, for example, when you're looking for journal articles. And that will bring back potentially an article that's useful to you if, they, if the author's given it a funny title and the actual concept you're interested in is mentioned in the abstract but not in the title. When you're searching iDiscover, which you all seem to be doing happily, one of the issues about iDiscover is it's really searching titles, whether it's journal titles or titles of articles or titles of books. So if your word is not in a title, you're not going to get that returned. And finally, um, there's this wildcard question mark symbol. If you put that in a word like woman or women and you replace the A or the E with the question mark, again, you'll get both instances, singular and plural. So I'm hoping you're all really familiar with Boolean operators. So and would require both terms to be in each item returned or will return searches with either term. Not, the second term won't be searched. And you can use brackets um, to enclose your search strategies. So if you're getting really refined, so if you're interested in social class and then you also want to put children, you can put social and class and brackets children on the outside, or and children. A lot of databases do assume and, so they, you put two words in and they will usually and them together, and certainly I discovered does that. But some databases using these will help you. So just to ram it home in the most simple way possible, so if we were searching for smoking and cancer, we'd only get the things in this lap, overlap of the Venn diagram. If we used or, we'd get <coughs> everything on smoking, everything on smoking and cancer, and everything on cancer. And of course, if we use not, it, we'd only get articles on smoking, but nothing that was in the blue circle whatsoever, so only this segment. So you'd have a reduced number of articles. So if you've got too many <coughs> hits, which is always a problem in the digital world, you can do some of these things to try and narrow your search. Right, literature searching. So let's go into iDiscover and have a look at an, an example. I'm hoping this is going to work. Okay, so I've gone home for the Easter holidays. I'm nowhere near Cambridge. I'm off campus, so I'm going to log in. And put my Raven ID in, just to make sure I get all the full text and 
everything that's not available to the general public. It also means, of course, you can look at your library account um, and you can renew things remotely, but you won't need to because it's automatic renewal. So all the books you've got out now will just automatically renew through the vacation. So you won't need to do that. So um, I'm going to look in articles and online resources because as we've already discussed, you're doing an essay, you want um, some good scholarly resources um, and you're all doing this anyway. So this will take me to journal articles primarily. So I'm going to look for um, technical education in that order and British economy in that order. So I've got a huge number of results. Is this what you experience when you do this? So I've got, unfortunately, I've got 18,000 results, and there's no way we can scroll through 18,000 results. So, oh God, what, what can I do? Right, well, I think um, we definitely know we want the peer reviewed journals. Um, so I think we'll, that will get it down to 12,000. Oh gosh, only one peer reviewed journal. This is I discover misbehaving. Look at that, we've got one result. Oh, well, that's problem solved then. I'll just read this and do my essay. Okay, reset filters. Let's try again. Um, what I was going to do was say, um, we only want really recent stuff, actually, because, you know, it might be interesting to do the history of technical education, but I really just want to know about the last five years. So that's reduced it to 4,000... Um, 572. Um, if I do peer reviewed, it's going to take no records. Why are you misbehaving? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, you don't want to play. So there are other things you could do. You could say, well, I only want articles. It doesn't like it. It's not behaving at all, is it? Okay, well, we'll have to stick with 4,000 results. So at this point, um, we're kind of stuck scrolling through it all. I guess at this point, I might be tempted to add another word or something to try and knock this down. But as I'm not doing a real essay, I don't know what to do. Are you all using this pinning feature up here? So when you're looking for your essay, you might be going down here and you might go, oh, blimey, um, these aren't even anything to do with technical education. My goodness. Right, I'm going to log out and I'm going to log in again. Because <laughs> that's just rubbish. I'm glad I gave you that speech about it misbehaving before I tried to demonstrate it. Right, let's log in and start again. Right, we're looking for articles and online resources. I'm going to try something different. And I'll just put education in, see if technical is upsetting it. Okay, that's much better. We've got 127 results. I'm going to put the date down to 2015. And I've got it down to 18 results. Now that's actually a manageable list to go through. So I might be going along here going, oh gosh, yeah, I need to read this. The government must address the post-Brexit industry skills gap and you can pin it to your list up here. You could go through doing that, and then when you go back up here and click on the pin, all of the items you've collected are here. So you could just tick the ones you want to read, or you could tick the whole lot, and you can actually email them to yourself, and you'll get clickable links through. So if you're, not, if you're just doing a quick search and you want to come back and look at it later, 
you'd be able to send yourself those links and be able to read individual things via that list later. And you'll see you can also export it to BibTech if you're using LaTeX and you're using BibTech for your references. So I don't know whether you use reference management software. It is a good thing to do, but it's not something I'm actually going to teach today. Um, but in a way, in a sense, for something like this, at this stage, you probably don't need to do reference management in that way. But as you progress, you might want to get to grips with that. OK, so I've already mentioned a conlit. So conlit is a really good place to go to get economics literature, so you get working papers as well. It's most of the top economic journals, so you know it's going to be really good and really from an economics angle. What you may be less aware of are Web of Science and Scopus, which are two really big um, interdisciplinary databases. Web of Science is probably less good for you, although I wouldn't say it's a complete waste of time to search it, but Scopus will search economics literature and it will cross-search it with other things like health or education. <laughs> so if you're interested in a sort of crossover area in economics, that might be a good way to go. Um, they both allow citation searching, so citation searching is basically when a paper is really, really well thought of, lots and lots of people then cite that paper when they're writing their paper, so that's an indicator of quality. You just have to uh, be a bit careful, so I'm sure you all remember the scandal about measles and rubella and the vaccination and autism, and there was a, a medical paper that was written by somebody saying that there was this link and it's now been completely debunked and it's a load of rubbish, but it is one of the most cited papers in the world because basically because the guy was wrong. So everybody's citing him not because it's great, but because it's wrong. So just be a little bit careful, but generally speaking, if a paper that you're looking for is cited a lot and you can see those counts in Scopus and Web of Science, you know it's a really good one or it's a really key one. We've also got Bibliography of Asian Studies. So this is a multi-subject database, including economics. And this is useful if you're wanting to look beyond. If you've got a very narrow search, you haven't got many hits, you might want to go here because you might find something that's not indexed elsewhere. But I highly recommend Business Source Complete. We, in fact, have Business Source Premier now. So we have the full access to this Elsevier database and it's business banking and finance. It goes right back to 1886, which you probably don't care about because you only want the up-to-date stuff, but it is a really, really good one, um, and you definitely, it's worth going into it on its own. So if you're not sure how to find these databases, you can put them into iDiscover, or on the top menu, there is actually a link to an A to Z of databases. So you can look them up on the A to Z and just go straight in and start searching in that database. But as I say, if you're off campus and you're doing that, make sure you've logged into Raven. Right, so why am I saying all this? Because basically what you're doing here, if your essay is a mini literature review, when you come to your final year and you're doing your dissertation, you'll have to do a much more thorough, proper literature review. But for this, what you're doing is kind of a mini literature review. Why would you be doing it? Well, when it comes to your dissertation, it's to identify gaps in current knowledge. So the idea is that you're writing about something from a new angle, that you're looking at um, an angle of economics that nobody else has talked about before. So you don't really want to embark on a project and then think, oh gosh, I'm duplicating what somebody else has already done. So that's why you would do it. At this stage, clearly you're not writing something that nobody's written before, you're writing the answer to an essay, but it's an opportunity to practice the skill. Um, so there's a load of things on this slide about why it's a good thing to do. I'm not going to read it out to you. Um, but the last one here does say what you're really doing is looking for ideas that are relevant to your essay or your project. So it's a good opportunity to practice that skill. Right. Really, really important for economists are working papers. Um, I guess you've all used working papers before, but in this context, it's a really good idea to have a look, especially if you're looking at something where a paper hasn't been published yet, or maybe you've got somebody's paper, and if you go into a working papers database, you can see 
the genesis of how they got to that model or that idea by going through the working papers. Sometimes there's quite a conversation that's gone on, there's more than one person, and they're doing those working papers and then eventually it becomes a peer-reviewed article. So that's a bit different to other disciplines in social sciences where it might be more of a direct-to-journal style publication. So in our discipline, you do need to check the working papers. So you're probably aware we actually have our own series, which is quite famous, the Cambridge Working Papers in Economics. They're all available on the Faculty of Economics website, but the way they're arranged is in date order. So if you go there to that page, you'll see what's been published most recently, and it may have no relevance to your essay. So it's probably not the best place to search in a keyword style way. If you find um, a reference to a working paper in iDiscover, and it is one of these, then you can go there and locate it by number. And you should get straight through to the full text online. Another place to go, which is used by the whole um, discipline of economics, is REPEC and IDEAS. And this is where a lot of our academics are publishing their working papers, as well as um, they may well be indexed. The CWPE will be indexed in REPEC. And if you do go to search on iDiscover, it's not like searching for journals and articles. So when I was demonstrating, I had clicked this articles and online resources pip. For the working papers, you need to click Cambridge Library's collection. And that's because they're not published items. So although what you're reading is similar to a journal article, they're not indexed as published peer-reviewed articles. So if you know exactly which one you're looking for, put the author and title in or just the author and click that. I put Oliver Linton in there because I know he's done a lot of working papers recently. What you will see, you may well see his published papers, but you'll see his working papers as well. If I put Oliver Linton in and clicked articles and online resources, I'd only get his published papers, not the working papers. So I just wanted to make that clear. So I've already mentioned reading abstracts. When you've got your list, so say you've pinned 20 things off I've discovered that are really useful or on Econlit or somewhere and you've sent them to yourself, and you still may not know if you really need to read 20 things. So what's the quick thing to do? The quick thing is to read all the abstracts, which if you've sent that linked list to yourself, you'll be able to go down through the abstracts. And then you can probably get rid of 10 or 15 of them because they're not actually what you need to read. So you haven't wasted your time going in and trying to read the entire thing. So that's a really useful, quick way of deciding whether you, it is relevant or not. So you've done all this work, you've got a list of things to read, um, and you've got rid of the stuff you don't think is relevant. So what are you going to do? You need to read that stuff critically, because you've got to formulate an argument when you're writing your essay. So um, the way I do this is with these question words. You might have been given an alternative way of doing this if you had the um, fortunate opportunity to attend a critical reading workshop, which I know a lot of your college, colleges and college librarians will offer your critical reading workshops, so it might be worth checking that out and seeing if that's available, because they might go into this in more depth. But basically, you need to see what's being said, why is it being said, is it any good for you to use it for your essay, is it relevant? Are you going to get something useful out of it? When does it date from? Has it been superseded by something published more recently? If you found something on a website, it's probably even more important to think about these things. Like, who is the author? It's not obvious always. Um, why is it there? Is somebody trying to put forward a particular angle? Where is the person or organisation located? I mean, if it's a university or if it's a government website, you're probably pretty much okay. But if it's something else, it might not be okay. Or it might be that you're writing on climate change and you want to see what Extinction Rebellion is saying, and clearly that's going to be biased, but it might be relevant to your essay to mention what their perspective is on it. So... And then you're going to have to make notes. So you need to be brief. You need to give a clear and accurate picture. They should help you with critical evaluation. 
and it's an opportunity to then sit and think about it and come up with your own questions and your initial viewpoint. Obviously, as I've said earlier, you might have a different way of doing that. I'm not prescribing it. Do what suits you best, but it points, mind maps, whatever. Um, I don't know whether you've been told this already, but this is something I've always found useful. So I think it's really meant for lectures or exam revision. So you sit and listen to your lecturer and you've divided a margin in your paper. So you've got two thirds of the paper for taking notes. And later when you review those notes, so you could do this with your reading, um, that's where you could write your reflections and your questions on the left. So it just might help clarify it, bring it down into more succinct, summarised, precede bits of information. So other basic things. Do put down full references of what the journal article is and where it's from, the full details and the page numbers, because you're going to need that information to do the referencing. Um, make a note of when you made the notes, because you might have forgotten them when you go back to look, if it takes a while, a few weeks. Uh, it's a good idea to write your purpose or exam question or keywords at the top, so you keep your mind focused. Try not to copy what you're reading. It might seem really, really obvious, but the more you do it, the, more, the easier it is to plagiarise somebody by accident. Because when you reread those notes, you're quite likely to have forgotten it's not you who wrote that. If you haven't put it in speech marks, you're going to think, oh, wow, wasn't I eloquent there? And very dangerous. Distinguish between your main points and argument and your minor points and examples. It's absolutely okay to use quotations. Make sure you put those quotations in speech marks. Again, this may seem really obvious when we're sitting here in an abstract way, but if you go back to notes sometime after you initially wrote them, can you be sure what you wrote or what was directly from the author? It's absolutely crucial to put that in speech marks and reference the author. But it's also not enough. If you pep your essay with lots of quotations, it's not really saying what your view is. So you must comment on it. You must, if, if you've selected a quotation, why have you selected that? What have you got to say about that? Why does it speak to you? How does it match your essay question? And if you're struggling, it's always a good idea to do pricing, to summarise, to repeat, to go over things, because it helps you gain understanding, especially if it's something a bit difficult. So I'm sure none of this is rocket science and you've been told before, but I just thought it was a useful opportunity to remind you of some good practice. I'm actually writing an article myself and doing a lot of reading at the moment, and I'm having to revise this to think, what do I really need to say? What do I really need to know? Right, plagiarism. So it's a form of academic misconduct. Clearly, it's not the only form of academic misconduct, but it's a pretty bad one, and it's one you, um, you have to sign that paper every time you hand essay, work in, project, dissertation, to say you haven't done it. So... I'm sure that none of you have plagiarised on purpose. I'm sure that's not how you want to get your degree. But it is really easy to do it by accident. So you just need to avoid it. So what can we do? Well, we've already talked about good note-taking. Be really clear what common knowledge is. And I think you all are better placed than me to know what common knowledge is in um, economics. But common knowledge might be, you know, which three digits indicate the number for pi or... Um, the, the Eiffel Tower is in Paris. We all know this is a fact. We don't need to reference somebody saying that. So in a sense, it's common sense, but it might be a little bit less clear in your discipline. So if you're unsure, I'd suggest you ask supervisors if you've got something that's confusing you. Reporting and summarising is important. More important than that, I would say, is learning how to paraphrase. So you can do paraphrasing, and I'm sure you paraphrase all the time, but have you done it well? You can't just kind of repeat the argument. If you just change the words round, then you're not really rewriting it in your own words, and it doesn't show good understanding. Paraphrasing is really hard. I um, actually have been working with some librarians on how to teach this to people. I made the librarians do some, play, uh, some plagiarizing, some paraphrasing, and um, quite a lot of them found it incredibly difficult. 
Now, I'm expecting that all of you are going to be much better at it than we are because you're studying all day, every day. That's what you're doing. But I think it's a very good exercise for us to remember this is not easy. And last but not least, reference correctly. So here are Jasper's tips. There is this um, plagiarism lib guide. So if you're not happy with plagiarism, I really suggest you go and have a look at this. And there's some very clear examples. Um, there's one for arts and humanities, one for social sciences, which is an economics example, and one for STEM. It won't do you any harm if you look at any of them, actually. They're all just text. Um, what they do show is somebody doing it badly and somebody doing it well and what the difference is. So if you're not sure, if you've done your paraphrasing well, this is a really good place to check out. And then I also suggest that for referencing, you go and look at the Economics Referencing Guide, which is on the Economics Lib Guide. So this is the address down here. What you've got on the left is explaining how to do in-text referencing, which people generally refer to as Harvard. There is more than one way of doing a Harvard or author date referencing system. This is the one that's been agreed by Undergraduate Studies Committee at Economics. So if you do this, you can't go wrong. If you've got another system you're really happy using, use it. They won't mind. They just want you to be consistent. But if you're struggling and you're not sure how to do something, it takes you through specific examples, including um, how to do a working paper. So it's very relevant to economics. So all the examples are economics examples. Right, you've got two minutes to do a little exercise before you go and um, see if you can get this reference in the right order. So maybe write on the back of your um, keyword paper or something. I'll just give you a minute and then we'll have a look and see what the answer is. Okay. Right, so you should have got them into this order. So you've got your author, then your date, then it's the chapter title in inverted commas, in author or editor, the title of the book, which is in italics, place of publication, publisher, and page numbers. So hopefully, what you're seeing now is the order you put that into. Right, you can have 30 seconds now to write down what you did learn, so I hope you've learned something. And is there anything you need to learn more about or something you want to know about in more depth? Could you answer that question as well? And then last but not least, I do would, would really like you to give me a mark out of 10, where 10 is excellent, obviously. Hopefully you're giving me 10. If you're not giving me 10, and there's something I can improve on, then please write that in the comments box. When you've done that, you're very welcome to go. If you've got any further questions or you want a one-to-one -one helping with search or anything, then you can either email me directly at CLT61 to make an appointment or email Marsh Lib, and either I or Simon Frost will help you, but do make an appointment. Or if you've just got a question, come to the issue desk and we'll help you. I hope it goes really, really well, and I hope that some of what I've said today has been useful for that exercise. If anybody's got any questions, I'll be here for three or four more minutes, so you can come up and talk to me individually if you want. If you could put your minute papers in that box before you leave at the front, that would be great, thanks.